Good morning, everyone. It's Charlie Jordan here once again bringing you our fifth lesson for Algebra 2 Tree. Can you believe it's been five weeks already? I can't. This week, we're going to continue um, looking at essential concept number three, which is focusing on trigonometry. So last week, we talked about sine, cosine, and tangent. We reviewed those, right? And we also discussed their reciprocal functions, cosecant, secant, and cotangent. And we really dove into developing our understanding of the unit circle. This week, we're going to begin with um, radians and degrees, and then we're going to tie everything together and see how it all relates. So let's begin. How do we measure angles? In regards to a coordinate plane on a graph, okay, there's a very specific way that we need to measure angles. Our first thing that we need to know is that we're going to measure counterclockwise. We are going to begin with our positive x-axis, and that's going to be um, our initial side. And then when our, our angle measures, up, then the side that ends up is going to be our terminal side. So the x-axis is our initial, and when we measure up, it's going to be our terminal. Anytime that we measure angles in this way, it's going to be called in standard position. So that's just some terminology in case you hear that. Now, what if we measure angles clockwise? That means we're going to have a negative angle. So we're going to start with the x-axis and go backwards and go clockwise. But once again, you notice that both times we started with the positive x-axis, right? Yes, that's always going to be our starting point. And then finally, we have a thing called coterminal angles. Coterminal angles are two angles that are in the same position. They're just represented with two um, with different angle measures, which is okay. So let's look at an example. If I have this angle here and I measure it from the positive x-axis and I go counterclockwise, it's going to be approximately 130 degrees. Now, for the same angle, I could measure from the positive x-axis in the clockwise direction, and that's going to give me a negative angle. It's going to give me negative 230 degrees. With those two, I could also come up with an infinite number of coterminal angles because I could say 360 degrees plus the 130. Let's do that again. If I start at the x-axis, I could go 360 and go all the way around and then go to an additional 130 degrees, meaning that this angle could be 490 degrees. And we could continue doing that process over and over and over again, but each time we would end at this one specific spot. Same angles, just representing them with different angle measures. So, degrees versus radians. Today we're going to dive into radians. We may you may not have even heard of radians before. We hear of degrees a lot. When we're learning in geometry, we're talking about 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 180 degrees. When I tell you a 90 degree angle, you know immediately that's a right angle. It's very common, okay? Radians, if I were to tell you pi over 2, you may not immediately know what that angle looks like because you're not as used to, to a radian measure. So let's think about it this way. Um, they're just two different kinds of angle measures. They're the same angle measure being represented in two different languages almost. So think about English versus Spanish. If I say hello in English and I'm speaking to someone and they say hola in Spanish, we are still saying the same thing, right? We are both greeting one another just with a different language. Think about Fahrenheit versus Celsius. If your mom tells you it's 32 degrees Fahrenheit outside, but your dad tells you it's zero degrees Celsius outside, it is still the same temperature. When you walk outside, you're going to feel the same coldness on your skin no matter which way that temperature is expressed. It's just two different ways. And that's how degrees and radians work. It's the same, the same measure, just expressing it in two different ways. Now, a tool that is really great, just like we can take anything written in French and we can translate it to English, or anything written in Spanish and we can translate it to another language. Any degree represented in Fahrenheit, we can translate it and represent it to Celsius, right? Okay, we can take any degree measure and represent it as a radian. So to do that, we're gonna use a formula. We're gonna take our degree measure and we're gonna multiply it times pi divided by 180. So let's look, let's see what that looks like. If I ask you to convert 40 degrees to radians, we're going to say 40 times pi over 180. Now, for radians, we want them to be exact. 
remember we've talked about round off air. Round off air can, if we do it too much, it can lead to creating an, an accurate answer. But if we keep our answer exact, we can prevent that from happening. In this case, you do not want to type pi into your calculator or 3.14. You simply want to multiply 4 times 1 over 180 or 40, I said 4 a while ago, I'm sorry, 40, or 40 divided by 180. When you do that, you're going to get 2 pi over 9. You could also um, read that as 2 ninths pi. But oftentimes you're going to see the pi in the numerator, so that's why I went ahead and expressed it right here. So a hint, if you see a measure and it has a pi in it, it's a clue that's a radian. Now what about taking radians and converting them to degrees? We can do the same thing. So let's look at this is, um, formula, radians times 180 divided by pi. Now the last formula, I'm going to go back, was degrees times pi over 180, but if we're going in the opposite direction, it makes sense to do 180 over pi, right? It sure does. Now think about this as well. Any time that we've looked at degree measures in the past, think about geometry, when we were talking about all of our triangles, did we ever have a pi in our angle? When we were talking about 300, de uh, 300 degrees, 180 degrees? Absolutely not. So if we're converting a de to a degree, we should know that our pi should go away, and we're gonna see when that happens. What if I ask you to convert 14 pi over 15 to degrees? We're gonna say 14 pi over 15 times 180 pi. Now we know that our final answer should not have pi's present because of how frequently we've seen degrees and we know that we've not seen pi in our degree measures. Why does that happen? We notice that our pi's divide out, right? They divide out to one, exactly. Some of you may refer that to refer to this as canceling. And you can, but mathematically, that's not a correct term, correct expression of what's happening here. What is happening here is our pi's are dividing out to one. So we're gonna say 14 over 15 times 180, and that's gonna result in 165 degrees. Pi's are no longer there, right? Okay, so let's talk about really how all this is gonna start tying together. We, how many of us love to go to the Greater Gulf State Fair every October? I do. I love the food. I love the smell of the food. I love going to get me some french fries, some pizza, maybe some funnel cake, right? We love the fair. Maybe some of you go up and down the midway and you ride every single ride. And one of the rides that never changes is the Ferris wheel. So you have a Ferris wheel in this scenario that has a radius of 75 feet. Okay, it has a platform that's 10 feet off the ground because think about when you go get on a ride at the fair, you're not standing on the grass when you get on the ride, are you? No, you have to walk up the platform to get on the ride. Exactly. So this platform is 10 feet above the ground. Now, you're going to rotate negative 255 degrees before the ride temporarily stops. Whew, I don't know about y'all, but that's like my worst fear is a ride having to stop. But we're just going to say this one had to stop so that someone could finish getting off the car. We're not going to say it was a mechanical malfunction. So my question to you is how high above the ground are you? Let's figure this out. So first thing, let's draw a picture. I don't know about you, but to me, if I can draw a picture to symbolize what's going on, it just really helps my mind wrap around the scenario. So we're going to draw a picture. We have a Ferris wheel here. What do we know about this Ferris wheel? <laughs> We know the radius is 75 feet, right? What else do we know about this Ferris wheel? It's 10 feet above the ground. Yes. Okay, so my question to you now is, we know we rotated negative 255 degrees, so what's gonna be your location approximately when the Ferris wheel stops? Looking at this Ferris wheel, where are you gonna be at? Are you gonna be at the bottom? Are you gonna be at the top? Where are you going to be? Are you going to be somewhere in between? Let's think about it. So we know we rotated negative 255 degrees. What does that angle measure tell us? That we rotated clockwise, right? So our Ferris wheel is going in this direction. Okay. Now, what else do we know? We started at the bottom. We started down here. You don't get on a ride anywhere else. You get, a ride, you get on a ride of where it's closest to the bottom. So what does that mean? 
if we were to impose a, a coordinate plane on top of this, we started at the bottom, which is how far? Where do we start angle measures from? We're supposed to start angle measures from the x-axis, right? So how far is the bottom? It's 90 degrees away from the x-axis, right? Okay, so we were already in negative 90 degrees before we even rotated. And now we've rotated another negative 255 degrees. So we've rotated a total of negative 345 degrees from the positive x-axis, right? Okay, because we're pretending that's going to be our x-axis. So where is that approximately? Well, we know it's 15 degrees. If we were to change that, the coterminal angle would be 15 degrees. Okay, 360 minus 345 is 15 degrees. So we're 15 degrees above the x-axis. So we're right about here on the Ferris wheel. Now, my next question to you is, the, que the, the problem is how high above the ground are you? So we know we're talking about trig, so we know we're probably going to have to use a trig function, but which one? There are so many. There are six, sine, cosine, tangent, cosecant, secant, cotangent. Which one am I going to use? I'm going to use sine because we're talking about how high. How high above the ground are you? And whenever we're talking about height, we're talking about our vertical axis. And so we know that sine is opposite over hypotenuse. And last week when we dove into our unit circle, we realized that every time we used sine, we were finding the y-coordinate. And every time we were using that triangle, our radius was our hypotenuse. Now with the unit circle, our radius was always 1. In this case, is our radius 1? No, it's 75 feet. If we had a Ferris wheel, the radius of 1, would it be any fun? Not for us, right? Maybe for like if you were a little kid and you had some some um, little dolls that you were playing with, maybe, but for us it wouldn't be fun. So we need to consider that, remember to consider that the radius is 75 feet. Now, before we even begin solving, let's decide what are some unreasonable answers. This is a good test taking strategy for those of you who still need to take the ACT. Think about what are unreasonable or reasonable answers to help narrow your answer choices, especially if you're not exactly quite sure how to solve the problem. So let's discuss this. We know that it has a radius of 75 feet. So how tall is the Ferris wheel? We know this radius is 75 feet. What about this radius? It's 75 feet as well, right? So our total height of the Ferris wheel is what? Our total height is 150. But what about the bottom? We have to include these 10 feet at the bottom, right? So our total height is actually 160 feet. If I was at the very top of this Ferris wheel, I'd be 160 feet above the ground. What if I was at the middle of the Ferris wheel? What if I was halfway around? Well, a quarter of the way around, or three quarters of the way around. Can I half 160? No, I can't, because that would only give me 80. Well, I know that the bottom half of the Ferris wheel is 75 feet, but I also know that it's 10 feet above the ground. I can't forget about that critical piece of information. So I know that if I'm either a quarter of the way or three quarters away, but halfway around would be 85 feet. So I know that I'm not going to be more than 160 feet because I'm not at the top of the Ferris wheel. I also know that I'm not going to be less than 85 feet because I'm in between that spot, right? I'm not on the lower half of the Ferris wheel. So, but would it be reasonable to say my answer was 85 feet? No, because that means I would be right here at this point, and I'm not. I'm above that, right? Okay, so we know that we're looking for an answer that's between 85 and 160 feet. If this was multiple choice, we could cross out any or eliminate any answer that did not fall in that range. So now let's solve it. Let's review some things that we know. We know our radius is 75 feet. We know that our theta, our angle measure, is 15 degrees, and we know that we're going to use sine. Sine of theta equals y over r. We have three variables, th theta, y, and r. Guess what? I, those three variables, we already know two of them. We know our theta is 15, and we know that our radius is 75. So how are we going to solve this equation? We're going to multiply both sides by 75, right? Yes. Now remember, round off error, we want to prevent it. So we're going to put all of this in the calculator at the same time, at one time. Type it all in, 75 times sine of 15, 
and your calculator is going to produce 19.41. Um, that was not one of our reasonable answers. Did we make a mistake? No, we didn't. Let's talk about what 19.41 actually means. Okay, we calculated sine of 15 degrees. So 19.41 represents our height above the x-axis. Okay, that's not our height above the ground. And remember, the question was how high above the ground are you? I'm 19.41 above the x-axis or above the midline of the Ferris wheel. But how high am I really? 85 plus 19.41. I'm 104.41 feet above the ground. I guarantee you if a situation like this was on one of our standardized tests, 19.41 would be an answer choice. Because test writers predict for you to stop a, a step early. But we knew what an unreasonable answer was, so we knew that we were not finished when we got to 19.41. So we do know that we are 100.41 feet above the ground when the Ferris wheel stops. So let's go and move on a little bit more. Um, we're going to find all six trig ratios for this scenario right here. Sine of theta equals negative 24 over 25. Now, last week we did a problem similar to this, but I didn't have all this mess on the screen, did I? You're probably looking at me and you're like, oh man, what is that? What does all that mean? This is telling me that my angle, my theta, is somewhere in between pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. What is pi over 2 and what is 3 pi over 2? They're radian measures, right? And we're not quite very as familiar with radian measures as we are with degrees. So how about we're not exactly sure what this means. We know we can figure it out, right? Because we can convert these radians to degrees. Yes. Now remember that our conversion formula is radians times 180 over pi. So let's start with pi over 2. Pi over 2 times 180 over pi. Remember, our pi's are going to divide out, and so that's going to equal 90 degrees. When we do 3 pi over 2 times 180 over pi, our pi's divide out. So we have 3 times 180 divided by 2, and that's going to simplify to 270 degrees. Now, we are much more familiar with what a 90 degree angle looks like and what a 270 degree angle looks like, right? Well, that's equivalent to pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. It's just a different way of expressing it, a way that we're more familiar with, which is okay. Now, you're going to need to become familiar with radians more and more, especially as you progress to pre-cal, but for right now, let's go ahead and talk about it in degrees. But what does this mean? If I am measuring angles on our coordinate plane, we know that we start at the positive x-axis and we go counterclockwise, so I need to go in this direction. How far is 90 degrees? At the top, right? Okay, so if I went 90 degrees to the top and I rotate even more, I'm at 180 here. Guess where 270 is at? At the bottom. So now I know that sine of negative 24 over 25 is somewhere in between these two. It's either in quadrant two or quadrant three, but specifically let's see which quadrant it is in. Sine is negative 24 over 25. Sine relates to which part of an ordered pair? Our y value, right? Okay. In quadrant 2, there's a different characteristic about our y value than quadrant 3. So which, which quadrant do we need to be in? And why? We need to be in quadrant 3, right? Because that is where our y value is negative and sine is negative. Very good. So now we know that... Whenever we make our triangle, we need to make our triangle in quadrant three. Okay, so let's take sine and let's translate it to this triangle. We know that sine is our y over our radius or our opposite over our hypotenuse. So we know that we have a negative 24 and a 25. Our negative 24 is with our vertical leg and 25 is our hypotenuse or our radius. But what about the other leg? How do we find it? What did we do last week? We used Pythagorean theorem, one of our most favorite equations of our formulas of our whole entire math education so far. We love Pythagorean theorem. A squared plus B squared equals C squared. 
We know that negative 24 is a leg and 25 is the hypotenuse, so we need to plug these in. Be careful with your calculators, guys. When you plug in negative 24 squared, you need to make sure you put it in parentheses. If not, your calculator is going to put out a negative answer. And if you're working quickly and you're not paying attention, you will, know, you will not catch that the negative answer is unreasonable. We know anytime we square a number, it's always going to be positive, right? Yes. So when we square negative 24, uh, we're going to get 576. And when we square 25, we're going to get 625. Remember, the goal is to get b squared by itself. So I need to subtract 576 from both sides, resulting in b squared equals 49. How do we get b by itself? Square root both sides. Do we need to, include, do we need to consider the negative square root? No, we don't because we know that we're talking about length, right? Maybe. Why do we need to consider a negative? Because we are on the negative x-axis, right? So we know that saying that this, this length is 7, but in, if we're looking at a coordinate plane, if we're looking at a graph, we know that it is negative 7, right? Exactly, because we know all values on this side are negative. So we didn't need to consider that. Okay. So we know that sine is negative 24 over 25. What about cosine? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. My hypotenuse is still 25, but what is my adjacent side? Negative 7. Very good. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. My opposite is negative 24. My adjacent is negative 7. Why is my answer positive? A negative divided by a negative is a positive. Very good. What about cosecant? I know that cosecant is the reciprocal of sine, right? We learned that last week. So we can take our sine function and we can flip it. Yes. So my cosecant is negative 25 over 24. What about secant? I can flip cosine. It's going to be negative 25 over 7. And last but not least, what about cotangent? I can flip my tangent, so it's going to be 7 over 24, right? Yes, it is. So, guys, I have sad news for y'all. This is our last lesson for Algebra 2 Trig. Can you believe it? It's time for summer. Guys, make sure that you've done all of your work and that you've submitted your packets to your teacher so that they can get your grades done. It has been my greatest pleasure to bring these lessons to you every single week. I hope you've learned something, and I hope that you continue pursuing and giving your best to your education in the fall. Have a great summer.